Thank you. Uh, I am so happy to be here tonight. Thank you, John. Thank you, George. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you, everybody else. And thank you, all of you, for being here and um, thinking that this is a better gig than the debate that's going on. <laughs> I, I never thought I would beat a, de a democratic debate tonight, but uh, it looks like I did. <laughs> and so. Uh, the, now the challenge is on me because I now have to make sure that I perform by the way. So you're right, George. Uh, it's it's a it's a complex topic, but I don't know how you managed to have me here uh, in such a timely fashion, at a time when this is headline news and Washington is abuzz with you know what is going to happen next, what happened to Bolton. How did Trump stop the peace process? What was going on? So on and so forth. And especially, what are the next steps? I have a few minutes to try to explain to you a very difficult case. But I hope that during the Q&A session, you will do me a favor and ask all the tough questions that I have not addressed during my short presentation. And I look forward to the interaction. So Afghanistan, and I, you know, I will tell you that we cannot understand Afghanistan today, the policy and strategy issues that are involved, unless we really have some kind of understanding of the history and the country. And obviously, I'm not going to burden you with 5,000 years of history, but I'm going to go very quickly, as much as I can, over the essentials that you need to know in order to then come to more contemporary times. So a very old ancient land, um, wasn't called Afghanistan, obviously, all the time, but has had different names and has been a crossroads of empires and invaders from Alexander the Great, all the way to the Persians, and the Arabs who brought Islam to this land, to the Mughals and Genghis Khan, all the way to the British who came to the subcontinent of India and attempted to subjugate Afghanistan, and then realized that it's really not an easy land to subjugate, to control. Not only because of its geography, but also in its people, in, you know, in the sort of independent mindedness of the Afghans overall. But also because they realized, as good strategists, that Afghanistan is better off being a sort of no man's land at the time, in the 19th century. That is better off being a buffer state between the British Empire and the expanding Russian Empire at the time that was moving southward and conquering lands in Central Asia and the Caucasus and so on and so forth. So where, while, while these two competing empires were moving against each other, they realized that they might clash. And so what, to, in order to prevent this huge clash back then between the two superpowers, the two superpowers they described, they decided that Afghanistan was going to be the buffer that's going to divide them and keep them separate. And this is the beginning of how the West got involved back then in, in this area. You know, besides Alexander, let's say. Um, so Afghanistan fought three wars with the Brits. Uh, was never uh, colonized. So uh, it became a protectorate, meaning that its foreign policy was somewhat subjugated to British whim and will and wishes, while internally the British left the Afghans to run their own show. And that lasted until the early part of the 20th century, when uh, around 1919 or so, uh, Afghanistan basically said, you know, we no longer want you to run our foreign policy either, and we want you independent. And so this was one of the very few countries in that part of the world that was not colonized. And uh, we gained, gained full independence that early. Uh, at the time, Afghanistan had a very forward-looking king, Amonullah, who was inspired by Ataturk of Turkey. And he thought that maybe he could uh, 
stimulate Ataturk and turn Afghanistan into another Turkey, not realizing that Afghanistan is not Turkey. Turkey was in the you know, footsteps and a neighbor of Europe and was a very different society. Uh, but he attempted, he did. Afghanistan, all of a sudden, women were unveiled back in the 1920s. The queen was unveiled in front of the public, and everybody had to follow that. Uh, schools were opened. Uh, there were, there were, you know, there was this a bit of an air of liberalism in, in Afghanistan, but it was obviously confined to the elites in the big cities. So very few people, and the rural part of Afghanistan didn't understand this, couldn't understand this, and so. The British were also very, not very comfortable with this because Amadullah was showing interest in having good relations with the Russians, the Germans, the Europeans, and the British were a bit uh, uncomfortable with all of this. And they were still in India, so they were running the show in India. There was no Pakistan at the time. Uh, and I think they sort of provoked the rural uh, Rebel, rebels to rebel against the state. And they did. They overthrew Amarillah. And for a while, Afghanistan was a bit of chaos. And then it, another m part of the clan that Amarillah belonged to, who were closer to the British, came and took over in Kabul. Said, so this is the late 20s, early 30s before World War II. So Afghanistan from that point on, so we can say that from the 1920s without, with the exception of this particular episode, for the next 50 years or so, was a very stable country. People have this uh, idea that Afghanistan has always been at war with itself, that it has always been in chaos. No. So from the 1920s, to the late 1970s, and we're gonna cover this quickly, it was a very stable country. Uh, progressing slowly, developing, modernizing, but not taking a very revolutionary role. Uh, during World War II, it had a choice to take sides, like everybody else, like most independent nations. And it chose to remain neutral, actually, because of conflicting strategies it didn't want to get involved. So it remained neutral like Switzerland and other countries. And after World War II, uh, with the monarchy in place, uh, Afghanistan started thinking about more modernization. And it decided that it wanted to modernize, start to modernize its military first. Now, why? What happened right after World War II in that part of the world? was the fact that the British Empire left India. India was dismembered and Pakistan emerged. Pakistan became the home for what used to be Indian Muslims. And obviously, there's still a very large Indian Muslim population in India. But Afghanistan was no longer the neighbor of India. Pakistan emerged as a new nation state. On the other side, the Persians, the Iranians, obviously had went through their transformations and the Shah of Iran, the father of the late Shah, emerged. And so this was a time of decolonization. It was a time of countries finding independence. And Afghanistan, you know, was sort of moving along this path. And it decided that it wanted to modernize. And it decided that it was going to turn to the United States to seek help, to first help modernize its military institutions. So Afghan delegations came to Washington in the early 1950s, and the Americans at the time decided that it was not worthwhile. Why? Because they had two other allies in the region that were more important and more valuable. Iran and Pakistan that had emerged. 
And so, and then you had the Soviet Union, and this was the beginning of the Cold War. And so, in their calculations in Washington back then, they figured out that, well, we don't really need to have Afghanistan on our side. So we're going to say, thank you, but no. And so that was the decision. And the Afghan government at the time was a bit shocked. And it decided that it had no other option but to turn to the Soviets. And the Afghan government basically turned to the Soviets in the mid-50s and said, how about you guys? And they said, absolutely. <laughs> we open our arms. We give you a $100 million worth uh, credit line. You send us as many young Afghans as you want. We will train them. We will educate them. And we will also, I mean, they didn't say this, but this is exactly what they did. We will also indoctrinate them into the Soviet-style communist, Leninist, whatever you want to call it, ideology. The Afghan government didn't know that this was going on, but the Soviets were actually doing this. So thousands of young Afghans went to the Soviet Union and for training and education, but most of them came back also as Marxist Leninist members of a new form of Afghan communist party that the Soviets were bankrupting. And they have already had a vision for using them in the future to take over. So that went on. In the early 1960s, the Afghan monarch, Zahir Shah, decided that this was time for another step into modernization, and he was going to modernize the political system. But until that point, the country was run by basically a family or a clan. Everybody in the higher level, highest levels of government and decision making belonged to that clan or family. So there was no room for others in society to move up the ladder. And so Zohar Shah, who had been educated in France and was an open-minded king, another open-minded king, he decided that he was going to change the system from absolute monarchy into a constitutional monarchy. And allow for an elected parliament to emerge and a new constitution to be to be to be ad adopted and drafted and for men and women for the first time to be able to vote for members of parliament this is the early 1960s i know a lot about, about this because my own grandfather was, a, was one of those people who wrote part of the constitution so my family was very much involved in these things and so throughout the 1960s Afghanistan underwent a democrat democratization experimentation. I remember, I was a small kid, but I do remember my grandfather ran for parliament and he won. His sister was one of the first members, female members of parliament in 1964. Um, I remember free media, but by then it was just newspapers and radio. But radio was government controlled, but the, the, the print media was free. You had communists publishing things, you had Islamists publishing, and you had Democrats in the middle publishing things. This was the Afghanistan of the 1960s and early 70s. What the king did, obviously, was take power away from his own family. And the, person, the persons that he took power away from were his cousins, mostly and his brothers, and his sisters, and his uncles, and so on and so forth. One particular person who stood out and who obviously was very angry about the fact that the family had lost power was his cousin named Daoud, who was the last prime minister before the democratic transition. And Daoud was also the person who had reached out to the Soviets in the 50s. So he had very good relations with the Russians, even though he was a prince. He was called the Red Prince, by the way. But he didn't like democracy. And he didn't like the fact that he was out of power and out of office. And that his cousin, the king, was bringing people who were technocrats and professionals into power. So he 
instigated a coup through elements of the Communist Party of Afghanistan, some of whose members were in the army and air force, who had been trained in the Soviet Union. So Daoud aligned himself with these communist members within the army and the civilian. And in 1973, staged a coup while the king was vacationing in Italy, and he overthrew the monarchy, his own monarchy. And he proclaimed Afghanistan a republic. Being a prince, he proclaimed Afghanistan a republic with the help of these communists. Daoud was a nationalist, in essence. He was not a communist. And he was used by the Communist Party. And the Communist Party saw him as a stepping stone towards full power. In April of 1978, and I remember that very clearly, I was 17 years old, and my high school happened to be next to the presidential palace. On a fateful day on April 27, 1978, Another coup took place, a military coup, a very bloody military coup. And the communists overthrew the world. Massacred his whole family of about 60 people, including children, and took power and proclaimed Afghanistan a Marxist Leninist state. So, this is the Afghanistan that had undergone all these transformations. In 78, all of a sudden, it becomes part of the Soviet world. Immediate reaction the following day across the country, because it was seen as an atheist takeover by the Afghans. The average Afghan saw this as a communist takeover, an atheist takeover, an assault on their faith, on their culture, by a group that was atheist. And so there was. There was a, there was, this was the beginning of a rebellion. And the rebellion spread. Tens of thousands of people were purged and, and, and killed by the communists in the first two years. I, I, I all escaped, you know, <laughs> just barely. Every family lost somebody. It didn't matter whether you were educated or uneducated, as long as you. So they, they did what Lenin had done with purging society of its enemies. And that obviously didn't stop the Afghan population. It instigated them further, and it became a national rebellion. And the rebellion, in a, a year and a half later, resulted in the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. The Soviet occupation of Afghanistan was basically triggered because of the communist, the new communist government's inability to control the situation in the rebellion. The Soviet Politburo under Brezhnev at the time decided that it had a few choices, and the, the choice, the best choice for them was to invade Afghanistan. But Afghanistan was outside the Eastern Bloc orbit. And this was this was <laughs> a very unique, exceptional occurrence. Most of you remember. At the time, Carter was president. Their reaction to the Olympics. You remember the famous Soviet, the Christmas Eve Soviet invasion. Soviet track tanks rolling into Afghanistan. The Red Army occupying Afghanistan. And the, and the slaughter of Afga Afghans continues. So the Soviets had to pacify Afghanistan. And in order to do that, in the 10 years that they were there, more than a million and a half Afghans died in the war against the Soviets. A third of the population was displaced, and they had to flee their villages and their towns. Everything that had been built over several generations was destroyed. Institutions, capacities, everything was destroyed. They tried to revolutionize the, system, the society and bring about reform and modern you know, progress with their own slogans. But obviously, they had to destroy in order to do that. They killed in order to do that. 
So Afghanistan experienced probably the worst period of its history under that occupation. <clears throat> it sort of pales compared to what is happening today. But I, I want you to understand this because some of the problems that we have today directly relate to what has happened since the 70s and 80s, and what happened since the 80s and 90s. Millions of Afghans end up in Pakistan and Iran. Some of them, like me, were fortunate to end up in the West. And the war continues, but Afghans don't give up. They fight the Soviets until they kick the Soviets out of Afghanistan in 1989. With American help, with Western help, even with Chinese help, with Arab help, with Iranian help, even though Iran was against the, 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 the Americans, and with Pakistan paying, playing a critical role. And I want you to understand this because to this day, that critical role is shaping policy and strategy and decisions about Afghanistan. Pakistan becomes the conduit for billions of dollars of worth of arms, munitions, assistance, humanitarian, and otherwise, to millions of Afghans under Reagan to fight the Soviets. And Pakistan is empowered to manage this whole effort the Americans and others are giving it the money and the arms. Pakistan says, we will decide how to, how to use this. We will decide who to give it to. We will decide how the future will be shaped. You can trust us. You can count on us. And this is the time when you see the emergence of what we now call Islamist, radical extremist groups. This is a time when groups like Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda leave their own countries in Saudi Arabia, and I don't know, Algeria, and wherever, even Indonesia, wherever. And they come to Afghanistan to join what they call, and they see as a holy war against the communists. And Afghanistan becomes the battleground against communism. A very successful one. Two years after the Soviets leave, the Soviet Union collapses. Not just because of Afghanistan, but Afghanistan was the last battle. <coughs> but I want you to concentrate on one thing, the role of Pakistan. Pakistan is at the time run by a dictator called Zia ul Haq, who is also an Islamist, who thinks that he wants to be part and maybe even lead an Islamic empire one day, and that Pakistan will be the center of this Islamic empire. And for that to happen, that they would need militants and fighters and establish a network and infrastructure that could feed and manage millions of militants under all kinds of names. But for Pakistan, there was one very critical issue, and that was India. So on one hand, it wanted to expand and become a center of Islamic empire. On the other hand, it wanted to use it against India because India was the arch enemy. It is to this day. And since Pakistan had lost three wars to India, conventional wars, since partition, it felt that it had no option but to use Islamic militancy against India. That was the main tool, and to this day is the main tool that Pakistan uses against India. For that to happen, it needed Afghanistan under its control. Because Pakistan, if you look at the map, is a narrow country. And India is a large country with a huge army and more powerful than the Pakistanis. And every time India retaliates, it can bring Pakistan apart and run through Pakistan. 
And so for Pakistan to stop that, it's called strategic depth. It needed strategic depth in Afghanistan. Afghanistan would give Pakistan strategic depth in order to be able to defend itself against India. And in order for that to happen, it felt like it needed to control Afghanistan. In order to control Afghanistan, it needed to do it to Islamist groups. And so all the aid that Pakistan took in the 80s and 90s, it used to promote Islamists, who later on some of them became Taliban. And it used that in order to form a proxy army to be used for its own interests against India on one hand and against Afghanistan on the other hand. In order to control Afghanistan, they use it as the strategic depth territory they were going into. Afghanistan in the 1990s was in total state of chaos because after the Soviets left, the Americans and everybody else left too. And instead of fixing Afghanistan, instead of putting it back together, instead of giving it back to the Afghan people, they said, you know what? Uh, maybe the Pakistanis and the others can put it together. But the Pakistanis had another agenda, as I just explained to you. And so this is when we see the rise of these militant groups, including Al-Qaeda joining hands with the Taliban, who emerged in the mid-1990s with Pakistani, and to some extent even Saudi. And even to some extent, even in Washington, they had some support. <coughs> and the Clinton administration almost recognized the Taliban in the 1990s mm -hmm. as the legitimate government of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. You know what stopped them? The women's issue. The women's rights issue was brought up all of a sudden in Washington and said, what are you doing? You're recognizing a group that oppresses women in Afghanistan? You can't do that. And that put a stop to it. They were all deceived. They were, they were all given, fed the wrong information. And the Taliban emerged as dominant force. And Al Qaeda came back and joined them. And Afghanistan was a no man's land. It didn't have a, 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 a government. A, 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 a government. It didn't have anything, an army or anything. Because it wasn't put back together after years of destruction. And so Al Qaeda used Afghanistan as a base to plan for attacks around the world, including 9 11. We are a day after the anniversary of 9 11. I was one of the very few people in Washington back then who used to go around saying, you need to understand what is happening. Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan with the Taliban in Pakistan sort of giving them, you know, facilitating things for them. And, and, and many other militant groups and radical groups are not just focused on Afghanistan. Because there was a resistance to the Afghanistan that was fighting against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. A small resistance. But nobody was helping it. They are focused on you. You don't have to believe me. All you have to do is read their own literature. What they're saying. They were saying it very openly. We want to attack the United States. We will attack the United States. And they did. And then all of a sudden everybody woke up. Everybody woke up to the fact that, oh, we should have put Afghanistan together after the Soviets had done. Oh, now is the time to go back. Kick the Taliban out. Give Afghanistan back to its people. See if we can use that constitution from 1964 and, and put that system back into place without a king. And that's exactly what they did. They took the 1964 constitution and put it back in place with some revisions. With an elected president, a parliament, elected parliament, men and women coming back, trying to rebuild institutions that had been basically destroyed over, over a 30 year period. Back to normalcy, right? Well, I went back in December of 2001. 
I said, well, this is time for me to go back and try to help and rebuild this country. I spent three, four years in Kabul at a time when there was no electricity, no phones, no nothing. Even the, even the airport wasn't functioning properly. But you know, it was full of hope. Everybody was full of hope that we were going to rebuild this country. And so now we are 18 years later. And I don't want to go into the details of everything that happened in the past 18 years. But you know it has become America's longest war. You know hundreds of billions of dollars of your tax money has been spent in Afghanistan. You know 2,450 or so of your young men and women have died in Afghanistan, plus hundreds of others from other Western countries. And you don't know that more than 200,000 other Afghans have died since then, too. Only in the past five years, since Ashraf Ghani took over as president, we have lost 50,000 military personnel that want to start fighting the Taliban. So this is not a small war. This is not an insignificant war. And every decision that is going to be taken and is taken right now has an impact not only on the US engagement, but also on everything that we have done in the past 18 years, and also on the future fight against terrorism and the threats that exist, the games that are played, and how the world has sh sh changed since then. The post 9-11 world is no longer, or relationships are no longer the same today. The relationship with Russia is different. The relationship with China is different. The relationship with Iran is different. With Pakistan is different. With India, Saudi Arabia, and many others. So it's not the same context. And Afghanistan is no longer the same country. It is still bleeding profusely. Um, and it's very fragile. And uh, the decisions that we've heard and seen taken in the past few days and weeks obviously have an impact, whether good or bad. And I don't want to be judged on that yet. But we are at a critical moment right now. Uh, there's a lot at stake. I am in favor of ending the war, personally. I'll tell you what, personally, I think. I am in favor of a good deal. And we can talk about what a good deal means. I am in favor of bringing back not all, but most American military personnel in Afghanistan. And I think that condition of such, and geopolitics and geostrategy is such, that you still need to keep a foothold in Afghanistan of some kind of an <coughs> The security situation is such, and the threat perceptions are such, that you need to have still a Western and American foothold in Afghanistan, but a much smaller, a much more focused one. You need to continue at a much lower level to bankroll, unfortunately, Afghanistan's institutions, because otherwise it will collapse. And it shouldn't be just an American job, but it should also be shared with others. And I think that you need to try to do everything possible to bring the reconcilable Taliban into the fold. Because there are different shades of Taliban. There are the Taliban who are beholden to Pakistan and Pakistan's agenda. There are the Taliban who are beholden ter to terrorist groups. There are the Taliban who are victims of injustice and corruption. And there are the Taliban who are more Afghan than anything else, and the Taliban who are less Afghan than anything else. It's a very complex situation. 
but you need to aim to disrupt them. And you can do that only through talks and dialogue, in my opinion. More fighting after 18 years is not going to change anything. We're not going to be able to defeat the Taliban. And the networks and the structures that support them across the Islamic world. There are, if I'm not mistaken, 30, 40,000 madrasas in Pakistan that produce Taliban on a daily basis. We have asked Pakistan to dismantle these madrasas for the past 18 years. We have given them $33 billion of American money to do so, and they haven't. They have taken the money, pocketed it, but they didn't do anything in the name of the fight against terrorism. And so we need to we need to focus on what is practical and doable. We need to learn the lessons from the past, whether 18 or 40 years. We need to apply the best practices that we have learned. And we need to not disengage prematurely or irresponsibly. At the same time, we need to bring change and peace to this part of the world if possible. But there are so many competing and complex agendas at play with the new geostrategic map, again, with Russia, China, tensions, trade, Middle East, Iran, terrorism. It's not just one issue. That abandoning Afghanistan would be stupid, as we did in 1989. I will stop here so I can take your questions. Thank you. were against the United States, but most of the terrorists of the 9-11 were Saudi Arabians. No, no, I never said Afghans were against them. No, they the were, they used, so you're not they, saying they, the that Taliban the Afghans provided, yeah, play yeah, a The part. Taliban provided facilities to Al-Qaeda's Arab and non-Arab. You know, Al-Qaeda was a multinational organization, mainly run by Arabs. And the people who were involved in 9-11 were mostly Saudis. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No Afghans in there. But their hub, their, one of their headquarters was in Afghanistan under the Taliban. That's what it was. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, how much constructive control does this Taliban uh, leadership have over their constituent members? It sounds to me like we're negotiating a deal um, with a group that may not be able to control the substantial portion of their membership. Okay, so what good is it? So, uh, certain facts right now. Taliban control about, have full control of about 30% of Afghanistan. But maybe uh, fifth, uh, another 20% contested between night and day. And maybe that, uh, it shifts every day, but uh, includes about 40% of the population centers. And most of them are in the south and east of Afghanistan with pockets in other parts of Afghanistan. But they have the ability, because they are a guerrilla force, they're not a conventional force, they're a mobile insurgency guerrilla force. So they have the ability to strike very differently than a conventional force. Their biggest concern is to fall apart, to break apart. That is the biggest concern because there is a disconnect at some level between the leadership, the different levels of leadership, mid-level mid mid command, and for tools. And so that's why they obviously want a deal that could prevent that. But at the same time, there are a lot of Taliban who want to come back to 
Afghanistan. They are tired of being in Pakistan or in other countries. They are tired of being sort of held hostage. So this is why it's important to talk and open the door for them so that those who can, can come and join the rest of Afghanistan. While others may join ISIS, for example, Others may join other terrorist groups or form a new terrorist group. And that could happen. But one of the issues that was part of the agreement that has not happened yet, it has been put on hold sort of, even though Trump said it's dead. I don't think it's dead, I think it's on hold. He wants to improve on it so that then he can claim victory. But I did, you know, I, 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 I accomplished something historic. That uh, one of those elements, one of the conditions that has been put on the Taliban by the, uh, the American envoy, who has been dealing with them for the last 10 months, is that they would continue to fight terrorists, like ISIS and others, who would be a threat to America and, and, and Afghanistan and others. The Russians want the same thing. The Russians are on board saying, we want them to fight all those radicals who are a threat to us. The Chinese are saying the same thing. Even the Iranians are saying the same thing. So there is consensus at some level on what role the Taliban can play, pro productive and positive role, mm -hmm. given that there is a good peace deal, not a bad deal. Do I answer your question? Yeah. OK, I'm going to turn this way. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I've got a two-part question. Um, it, it, it seemed as I listened to you talk about the history and the development of this, that the conflict between Pakistan and India and how those two are playing around with each other sits at or near the core of the rest of what we're dealing with. Hey, is that a fair interpretation? To a large extent, it is a and second, driver, yes. Yeah. So at least my second question, which is, uh, do you think that um, our lack of strategic far-sightedness in some instances and maybe focus in this more modern instance is helping drive what uh, what is a, a military applied solution <coughs> problem but is ultimately um, going to be solved I think when we figure out how to get a handle on Pakistan. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Uh, Strategy vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan since 2001 has been inconsistent, lacking focus, fed with the wrong input, advice, and data, influenced by the wrong elements, and very erratic. If you look back, you see at least a dozen different strategic reviews and upgrades and shifts over the last 18 years. While the Taliban have had just one consistent strategy and followed it to the team. So, so that, yes, is, has been a huge problem. The other part of your question, the solution eventually is a it has to be a political. There is, I don't think that there is a military solution to this. Yes, military tools can be used at times effectively and strategically in order to promote and lead to a just political settlement. But you cannot win this war just militarily. This side doesn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to the middle. To the middle. Yes, I, I wanted to um, get some of your insight about Khalilzad, who is our negotiator. Um, could you tell us a little bit that he's been involved in the region for many, many, many years? And you mentioned one of the goals is to get um, the Taliban to fight our enemies, um, if possible. 
But what other goals do you think he's trying to achieve? I know he's got a mandate for President Trump, but what do you think, um, I'm just, I don't know if you know him. I have known him since the 1980s. So I would be really curious to hear your insight about him as he's negotiating this for the United States. I, I think that he is probably one of the most uh, insightful, knowledgeable, experienced American diplomats to deal with this issue. And I think that there are a lot of <coughs> rumors and, co and controversial um, remarks about him from different quarters, but it's some, sometimes it's political, sometimes it's personal. And I think that even what happened last week with Mr. Bolton, <coughs> on one hand, convincing President Trump to put a stop to Khalilzad's efforts and Nick's basically kill the deal before Mr. Mr. Khalilzad was able to brief the administration. This is very interesting. Here's the American envoy having spent 10 months dealing day in and out with the Taliban and others, including the Russians and the Chinese and the Indians and the Pakistanis and the Afghans, everybody. And he meets the president three weeks ago in New Jersey with his senior staff, with the exception of Mr. Bolton, by the way, which we don't know exactly why. But we know now that there must have been something, <laughs> because it's not on the paper. And he, and the, and the administration gives him, gives him new instructions, additional instructions as to what to do, and go back and continue the negotiations. And he comes back and he spends a few days in call with a very difficult Asha Bani was only looking at his own power base. And then he goes back to Doha to convince the Taliban of the new requirements, the new instructions that need to be fulfilled. We don't know the details. Nobody knows. So uh, everything that you hear about these negotiations and the, the details, the, the decisions that have been taken, are not great because we don't know. It's a secret. It's a very top secret thing. Even Bolton wasn't given the document. <laughs> the national security advisor was not privy to this document. So, not knowing what the final decisions were, Khalilzad finishes his discussions on Thursday or Friday last week gets on a plane to come to Washington to brief the president and others on the outcome of his talks <coughs> and the final draft. <laughs> the president, and before he arrives, the president comes out and says, well, I wanted to have everybody at Camp David and sign something. And an American soldier was killed, and a few Afghans were killed, and the Taliban were really bad people, and we're going to teach them a lesson, and we put a stop to this, and I don't want to continue. Right? <coughs> 24 hours later, mm -hmm. oh, and he does that at the insistence of Mr. Bolton. Pardon. 24 hours later, Mr. Bolton is fired. Khalilzad arrives in Washington. I don't know whether he has a chance to brief and debrief, explain what he has done, but I'm sure he has had the chance to explain what he has done and what the final copy may look like and what the details entail. But now we are in limbo because the president comes out and says, well, I'm gonna teach the, the Taliban a lesson and I'm going to go after them. The Taliban say, well, we finalized the work with Mr. Khalilzad, your envoy, and then we got an invitation to come to Camp David, and we, we said we can't. Maybe we can, but maybe, but we, we don't think we can. Because if we do, we might face a mutiny within our rank and file. That's basically what it means. And it's true, because if, if they come to Camp David, the rank and file who are fighting and bleeding every day will say, what, what, what is this, what is going on here? You're selling us out. 
And so we, to avoid that, we, we, we don't think it's a good idea for us to come to Camp David. And Mr. Trump is vexed and not happy that he's, turned, he's being turned down. And he calls the whole thing off, right? So if that happens, Bolton is fired, and now we don't know what's happening. So that's exactly where we are right now. We don't know what the next step is going to be, whether, whether Mr. Khalizot is going to be rehabilitated, whether he's going to be asked to continue <coughs> what he has done so far, whether he's going to be replaced, whether he's going to be promoted, demoted, I don't know. What happens to the peace deal that he has so far put together? I don't know. What we know is that fighting has intensified. Could, is it temporary? Is it tactical? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Maybe Trump wants to show force first, and maybe then he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm a, a master deal maker, then I'll, I'll come and you know, let's, let's, let's make a deal. Now I've shown you how, what I can do now, let's make a deal. I don't know, I mean, it's, it's open anybody's interpretation. But this is exactly where we stand. What about the election? Oh, what about the election? <laughs> are you talking about the American elections or are you talking about Afghanistan's elections in two weeks? The British. <laughs> the British is screwed up. And so are the other two. Uh, well, very good question. These people really know what I'm talking about. I thought I, thought I could get away with this. <laughs> I can't get away with this. Uh, the elections, in my view, are a huge problem. Elections under normal circumstances, with no peace efforts, with no, not so much fighting going on, with some level of security, some level of trust in the electoral system, some level of enthusiasm on, the, on behalf of the Afghan people, and even the candidates, ex with the exception of Ashraf Ghani, who was very enthusiastic, would have been great. But with all of these things happening, I don't know how he's going to put it off, except that it's going to be a project of the election, and it's just for him to come back. And it's going to be accompanied with a lot of blood, unfortunately. Because I don't think the Taliban are going to put up with this. They're going to do everything possible to disrupt the elections. And I don't think the rest of Afghanistan, including the elites in Kabul, most of them, keep up. They don't trust the system. And they don't trust, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't think it's the right time to do it. So elections are very problematic. Now, I don't want to talk about the 2020 American. No. <laughs> Back there, sir. Um, let me bounce some ideas off you and tell me if, if these are correct. My understanding is the U.S. gives more money to Afghanistan than any other country. A high percentage of the budget in Afghanistan is money coming in from the U.N. and other countries. And the government is only supported by 35 or 40 percent of the population, and the country is sort of a lot of factions and the government's not really in control. But these aren't my opinions, this one here. It's more or less true. <laughs> it's more or less true. Uh, comparatively speaking, we are raising more revenues now than we did in the 15 years ago or 10 years ago, if you want to look at it from that side perspective. We uh, are carrying a larger share of the burdens in every way possible, is especially in fighting. We are doing 99% of the combat fighting, and we're losing quite a bit. So America's, American forces in Afghanistan are, have specific roles. Yes, there's some fighting by special forces. There's air support, we have air attacks, logistical, training, advising, mentoring, all of that. But yes, so the combat is mostly carried out by Afghans. No more Americans or others, more than that extensively. Uh, the budget is mainly supported at maybe 70% or so by foreign funding. But as I said, we are raising more funds now than we did before. Um, 
But overall, the, the economy is not doing well at all because over the past few years, we have reverted back to fighting. And it's, it's so, so most of the money that existed, oh, and also corruption is, is a huge problem, huge problem. And, uh, and there's also a lot of smuggling. There's a lot of, we haven't talked about narcotics. I found this not happens to be number one, by the way, in producing opium in the world. And it's a huge source of income for both the insurgents and the bad guys within the system. And so, yeah, those, those problems exist. I'm going to shift back a little bit to the middle, and you guys have another chance. <laughs> <laughs> we actually got a peace agreement. What do you think holds a peace agreement that Afghanistan would actually look like? Look at what's going on now. Could you repeat that? Sure. If they actually got a peace agreement, what do you think the post Afghanistan would look like after the agreement? First, I think that the peace process is going to be a long and difficult. It might even end up taking a year or two to reach a certain outcome. We will have to discuss everything from women's rights and how most Afghans look at it versus how the Taliban look at it, to democratic rights, to media rights, to access to education and healthcare, all these things have to be looked at with the Taliban sitting at the table and trying to make sense with them as to what's good, what's not good, what's actually Islamic and what's not. Because their interpretation of Islam runs counter to other interpretations of Islam. Um, the post, once, if, there, if and when there's an outcome in a, in a settlement, I think that the, the next phase of Afghanistan is going to look like a mix of what we have, something between Saudi, Emirati, Iranian type system, but Afghanized. It doesn't say much, does it? Uh, it's, it's, going to, it's going to borrow certain things that we see today in this Saudi system, which is transforming itself. Also, certain elements of what we see in Iran, which is also an evolution or transformation. And maybe certain elements that we see in countries like Iran, the UAE, for example. Or Turkey, maybe even Turkey to some extent. That's what I think is going to be the next, if we reach that point. Last question. Sorry, I'm going to last, last question. Can we do two? Okay. Okay. I'm going to be. I'm going to be. Yes, ma'am. Could you speak a little bit about what would have to change for women to achieve parity under the law, rights to education, rights to own property, or do you think that something that is just never going to evolve? All of those are enshrined in today's laws. All of those rights to property, rights to education. Hmm? But but they're not in practice. No, 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 no. Where, wherever they can, and the government and institutions have sway and authority, that is the trend. I'm not saying it's perfect. I mean, which country is perfect? I mean, I'm just saying that that is the trend, and that it's moving in that direction. In some cases, it has really made inroads in a lot of problems. We have a lot of women in positions of power today. We have several women running as part of the presidential tickets today in Afghanistan. I think three of them. Um, so that is happening. But in areas where it's still either under Taliban control or contested or chaotic, then the situation is different. And rural areas, obviously, is different than urban areas. But today, Almost half of the Afghan population live in urban areas. One more question. You guys have another chance. To <laughs> yes, ma'am. Both um, Eric Newby's travelogue from the 50s and Rory Sturridge from 2000, I think it was nine, talk about the generosity of the Afghan people that when you knock 
open the door. You are, you're welcome in. It, it, has that beautiful tradition been any way destroyed in the last I'm glad you asked that question. Because I tried to tell you that Afghanistan for the, the real Afghanistan, the peaceful Afghanistan, the stable Afghanistan was such a different country. Not only was it about hospitality, but you as a woman could alone in the 60s and 70s or 50s enter Afghanistan, drive into Afghanistan by yourself, travel up across Afghanistan alone, and nobody would bother you and leave Afghanistan and go to another country. And be treated very well and respectfully. So that was the country that was. And today, unfortunately, it's no, no more. But I, I am hopeful that under certain conditions, it can revert back to that kind of situation. 